My name is John Hepburn, and it's my pleasure today uh, to interview Dr. Julius Debro. Uh, we're at the uh, 2016 meetings of the American Society of Criminology, uh, and we're glad to participate. Uh, I'm sure Julius is, and I'm willing to work with Julius on participating in this very important oral history project. Uh, we can begin with a, qu a quick review of Julius's background, and then we want to obviously let him tell us in his own words all the things that make him worthy of this honor today. So Julius, let's begin with the fact that uh, how did you move into the field of criminology? It's a nice open-ended question. Very strange way uh, because I was a criminal myself. Mm -hmm. I moved in primarily because uh, there were lots of things going on in my life at the time. I left Mississippi uh, in the early, early uh, 40s and things were happening in Mississippi, we were segregated, and uh, we had uh, all kinds of things going on in a place called Natchez, Mississippi. I moved to Jackson, and my father was in uh, Florida and decided to move us out of, the, out of Mississippi. I, of course, cried because I loved Mississippi at the time. I didn't know any better. Uh, and then we moved into Oakland, California, and lived in a high-crime neighborhood and uh, we did all kinds of small criminal things and I was never caught, but most of my uh, comrades were. My young kids that we ran around with, we uh, got caught. And so I then uh, started school and I went to uh, a black school in the black community in Oakland, California. And after graduation, I uh, received a scholarship to University of San Francisco majored in political science. Was that an academic scholarship? Uh, so, <laughs> I don't know whether you want to call it an academic scholarship, but it was a tennis scholarship. Uh, you, were, you were a good tennis player. I was a good tennis player, and I was ranked in California. Uh, the only African-American in California at the time that was ranked this was before Arthur Ashe. Uh, and, and that was amazing in itself, because in the amateur days, they just moved us into uh, places to stay in families' homes. No whites would take me, and so I stayed with Jewish people. Um, one was the director of the Abbott and Costello movies that I stayed for in Los Angeles. Uh, but I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know Jews from just white people. And so I went to Palo Alto, Burlingame, all up and down the coast of California, came into Seattle. Uh, they put me up at the Y. All the other players stayed at families' homes in Seattle. Uh, so. Uh, it was interesting. I got offered a scholarship to a Jesuit university, a great Jesuit university. That's the University of San Francisco. Yeah, and majored in political science. <clears throat> and after graduation, uh, I took ROTC and went on to the military. Uh, and then after getting out of the military, uh, I had a, a person by the name of Julian Roebuck, uh, who was at San Jose State. And Julian encouraged me to come and get a master's uh, in uh, sociology. Uh, at San Jose State, and I was working at the time at San Quentin, but prior to that time, we we're going to talk about it later, I worked in, in corrections, and so we can talk about that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, let's just go right there now. So, yeah. after you came back from the Army, you, you began working in the field, right? Right, yes. You were, what was your first position? Uh, group counselor, uh, juvenile hall. Uh, I, I started working there, and there were a lot of kids I knew that were there and young kids and from families and so I worked at Juvenile Hall in Alameda County for about seven years mm -hmm. and then I became a uh, probation officer and for I the county I didn't know what probation officers did yeah. uh, but they got paid they got paid so it was good enough right exactly <laughs> so it was really interesting to be a probation officer you had very little supervision you could be out in the field all day and so I did that for a while and then uh, the Department of Corrections in the state of California had an opening as, as a group counselor uh, at San Quentin. And so I applied for that job, took the exam, passed it, and uh, asked my boss at the probation whether or not I should, should go. And uh, he immediately said, um, I had an opportunity to leave county probation to go to the state. And I didn't do it, and I often wondered what would have happened if I had done it. So the next day I left and uh, took the job at San Quentin and worked in the Adjustment Center, and, uh, which was where the most uh, dangerous offenders were kept. 
we locked the door when we came in from the outside and they locked the door from the inside. Um, and that is the place where uh, the Solar Dad brothers were, were John Jackson, mm -hmm. what, George Jackson, yeah. what is his name, George. Jackson, you know, uh, was killed out of San Quentin. They right. said he was trying to escape, but there was no way he could escape from San Quentin with the high walls. So I worked there for two years and had an offer to go to federal probation, which was even less supervision. Uh, I was uh, assigned to San Francisco office, and at that time we had 15 probation officers. We covered all of California, from uh, uh, Monterey all the way down to the Oregon border. And um, I stayed there for about four years and uh, decided that I would leave there because I didn't think that the prison system would grow. Uh, the state of California was thinking about uh, uh, closing down San Quentin and they were going to close Soledad. And the uh, federal government had about 15,000 prisoners in the whole system. Had one women's uh, uh, facility, which was at Morgantown. Uh, and so I decided to, to leave and go back to school. And there was a fellow by the name of Bob Carter who had a great, uh, grant um, with the federal government to look at the state of probate, federal probation. And I was working on that grant and Bob said, uh, why don't you come to, uh, to Berkeley and get into the program? Uh, I didn't have to take any GREs. And uh, they just looked at my grades, which uh, was outstanding, like B minus, C minus, Fs, and they let me in. They said, hey, this is a black guy, we have one. And so I got in. I got in. This is the, the decrim. At the, the, at, the time, the decrim. at the time, Berkeley had the Doctor right. of Criminology program. Right. Dean Lohman was the, was the dean, and later Leslie Wilkins from England became the dean. Mm -hmm. So I got in the program about 64, I think it was. Four. So when did you finish your master's at San Jose State? Was that uh, why you were working? Did you go part-time? I went part-time. Um, it took me eight years to finish the master's. I, I drove literally from San Quentin uh, three days a week down to San Jose, which was about 50 miles. And I would leave San Quentin about four and get there nearly at seven o'clock in the evening. So every time I tried to skip a semester, um, Julian Roebuck would say, get your behind down here and, and sign up for classes. And so uh, he kept on me until I finished the, uh, the master's. And coincidentally, when he retired, I hired him at, uh, at the uh, at Atlanta University, uh, but he became a friend for a long time. He was just a great writer. Uh, but it was interesting because after I finished the master's and started the PhD program, Berkeley was wild. I mean, everything was going on at Berkeley from 64 to about 69. The Panthers and uh, free SDS. Speech? And free speech. Free speech and all that was going yeah. on at Berkeley. And of course, uh, the School of Criminology and intimately involved in that. Uh, and so as a result of, of our activities with the movement, uh, uh, we were eliminated. So we have no school of criminology at, at uh, Berkeley today. Uh, so my degree is non-existent, I guess. Uh, so I tell students that I made great grades at Berkeley, but they had some great professors, uh, Leslie Wilkins and uh, uh, who else? Uh, uh, Bob, uh, Bob Carter. Uh, okay, I'll think of some more later on. Yeah. Yeah. Jerry Scullin. Yeah. Okay. And so, did you work with Wilkins? I mean, who was your mentor? Yeah, uh, a, a guy by the name of uh, Shelley Messenger. Messenger. Yeah. Who took him nine years to finish his PhD at UCLA? I worked with Shelley, and I with uh, Meisner, who was mm -hmm. police. And Meisner was, Gordon Meisner. Yeah, mm -hmm. Gordon was the person who introduced me to Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences, like '71 or so, mm -hmm. uh, and took me up to Seattle, and I met with those people. Then he also took me to ASC, and uh, as a young student, we were greatly impressed by Marvin Wolfgang and uh, Myron, uh, Dick Myron, and uh, the greats of that time. And we would sit around the bar and just watch them talk. Didn't say, didn't say a word, we just watched them. And so I gradually uh, moved into both of those organizations. And then, and then 
like your like your mentor, you too took a while to finish your doctorate because you didn't you leave before you had your degree? Yeah, I left. Uh, I was told not to leave. I was told to stay at Berkeley and finish it. That was uh, I finished all my coursework in '69. Uh, I had uh, Marvin Wolfgang invited me to come to Penn for an interview. No one told me how to interview, or what to do, or even talk about salary. So I went there for three days, gave le lectures, and uh, nobody said anything about salary. They didn't say anything, and I didn't. So when I got back to Berkeley, I got an offer of $13,000 to go to Pennsylvania to uh, teach. Uh, I didn't like Philadelphia, uh, because I had grown up in, on the West, which was nice and clean. Philadelphia was dirty, filthy and old homes and old buildings. We may have to edit that out of this conversation, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I didn't go, and then I got an offer from uh, University of Maryland. They had not started their uh, criminal justice program, and so Charles Welford and myself were in sociology with... Uh, with uh, Peter Allegiance? Peter Allegiance. And uh, Pierre, uh, taught us both a lot. He, he was an international criminologist. He was from Lat Latvia. And so uh, what he would do is invite Gerhard Mueller and people from Latvia and they would, and from overseas, and they would exchange visits. And when he brought, brought in a speaker, all of us had to invite our undergraduate students to uh, listen. So the speaker thought that he was really important, but actually we gave them points for coming to the lecture in the evening. And um, Pierre would not allow us to miss uh, those lectures. I mean, you could only miss them if you were dying. You had to sign in when you went to his reception after the lecture at his house. And he, he ran a very tight ship. Uh, he would not, uh, we would have uh, meetings and Pierre would let you say a few words. Uh, but not many, and I remember distinctly that I got into an argument with him, and I left, and he says, no one leaves my meeting, and I said, I do, and I walked out. And from then on, we, we, we had a good relationship, but uh, I believe I learned a lot from him in terms of inviting international people to come in and speak, uh, telling professors that they had to bring their classes to, to the lecture. I thought that was really, really efficient. But uh, Pierre was, was quite a person. Didn't write a lot, but knew everyone in the field. Okay. And how long did you stay at Maryland? I stayed in Maryland from 71 to 78. Uh, during that period of time, no one told me that I had to uh, prepare a vita, so for promotion. So I'm, I'm there all by myself, and we had moved into criminology, criminal justice at the time. Uh, had a nice faculty, but they never told me what to do to prepare for tenure. So I went up early, and they said, well, we're not going to promote you because you went up early. So I said, I probably will leave. But then uh, I received a grant from NIMH to look at the state of, um, what was it, the state of, of um, correctional officers, I think it was, um, uh, minorities in, in the correctional field. Okay. for about five states or so. It was about 150,000 or so. And then I got appointed to the War College at Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So I asked for a year leave of absence and I left a grant. I, mean, I couldn't take it anyway, but I, the grant was with Pierre. And I stayed a year and I came back and he didn't give me the grant. And that's been my probably my most disappointment in the field that uh, I had gotten the grant and I worked hard to get it. When I got back, uh, they had taken it and given it to someone else, and I never got it back. And the thing I learned from that is that if you are a principal investigator, never give up your grants. Always keep your grants and always work on them. Yeah. So then you left Maryland and went to? I went to uh, a commission <coughs> on, what was uh, the commission called? We tried to combine ACJS and ASC. Oh. I read, did that for a year. That was the uh, Joint Commission Joint. on Criminal? Criminology and Criminal Justice Education and Standards. Right, that was the committee. And that was designed primarily, <coughs> was funded by uh, LEAA at the time, by a guy by the name of Price Foster. Dick Ward uh, had gotten the grant, and uh, they couldn't find anybody else to take it for e um, during that period of time. And I happened to be at Maryland, and I was dissatisfied at Maryland, so I took it. Uh, and uh, we had 
four members of the Academy of Criminal Justice Science on the grant and four members, not on the grant, but on the commission, and four from uh, ASC. And they never interacted together. They, want, they would sit on one side, these ACJS people and ASC people would sit on the other side. And so, uh, yeah, but the purpose was to explore merging the two yeah, societies mm -hmm. in some way. Right, they were going to merge, and they thought they would have a more effective uh, position with the government if they merged, and they could uh, formulate policy. Okay. And, so you, and that, you were, yeah. you wanted to do that. Yeah, I, I mean, want, you wanted. To yeah, I wanted to do it. I, th I thought it would be a good thing to do that uh, because ACGS was primarily formed because of police and practitioners. So it still is as, as much they deal with police and practitioners. Uh, ASC was more research oriented and so some of us belonged to both organizations uh, and so there was some interaction between the two and that will never happen in my lifetime uh, that they will form one organization even though they talk about it periodically. Uh, so I did that for a year and at the same time there was um, a serial killer down in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, going on with um, another person from uh, DCRIM uh, called Lee Brown. And Lee Brown was running the um, Department of Public Safety uh, down in, in Atlanta. And another person that was called by the name of George Napper, who was the chief of police from Berkeley as well. And so I went down to try to help them to find the killer of black kids down in Atlanta for one year. year. This was, this was the, what, about 20 different children? Yeah, about, uh, over about, time were yeah killed? About, about 20 different kids, I, yeah. I can't remember. And they were all young kids under the age of 17 or so. Yeah. And they killed them and the FBI was there. It was a national right. uh, search for this young person, so I was down there. They had all kinds of scholars coming in looking for things. And I had never taught at a historical black college what we call an HBCU, uh, although there are a hundred in the country and I had never gone to one. So it was an exciting time for me to go down there and once I got there I stayed uh, 12, 13 years. You're talking about Atlanta University? Yeah, Atlanta University, yeah. which was a graduate school. It was not an undergraduate program. We had nothing but graduate students at Atlanta University. No money. Uh, the endowment was about 15 million, that was about it. And so uh, the pay was just a little over the 15000 I talked about when I first looked at getting a job and doing some things. And you were chair of the department there for, yeah, I was for chair 12 years or whatever it is? 12 years. I chaired uh, public administration. I chaired sociology. I chaired uh, criminal justice. Right. I had the criminal justice institute there. And I brought in about, uh, about uh, I say, I was trying to think of an average of, uh, at least a hundred thousand a year, so yeah. maybe more. Was, did you kind of develop that institute, kind of using the Maryland Institute as a model? Uh, no. Or we, did you learn some lessons from the Institute at Maryland that you? We learned a lot of lot of lessons from the Institute at Maryland. Uh, one was that you had to get to know staff at LEAA and staff at NIJ and staff at uh, NIDA. Those, those were the three. Yeah an NIMH and so I, I embarked on learning how to talk to people and how to write grants. That what, writing grants is a skill that everyone should, should develop and the best way to do that is to invite people to come down and help you write those grants. So I had a, a person from Princeton to come down uh, by the name of Howard Taylor who is in sociology at Princeton, he's in sociology. and. Uh, so uh, he came down to help me write some grants and I invited people to come down and paid them to write grants and so we got grants. We had a grant, we had grants all the time. Uh, the other thing is to be very assertive once you get the grant with getting money into your department uh, because the administration would like to take all of the money and would not like to give you money to travel to conferences and uh, would only give you money to work in the summer at the same salary. So it's not only learning how to write grants, but once you get the grants, you first of all, you wonder, why did I want this grant in the first place? That's the first thing you think about. The second thing is, how do we get some money into the department, especially if you're the department chair? 
and uh, but at a historical black college where they had so little money, uh, the presidents would all, often put people on your grants you didn't know we were on the grant. And uh, so we, we ran into those kind of problems as well. So after, after being there for almost 14 years, tw as chair of 12, uh, why did you then move to University well, uh, of Washington? Yeah, a couple of things happened. Um, is that we went to NDRI, I took a leave of, not a leave, a, a sabbatical to NDRI in New York City. What is NDRI? National Drug Research Institute. Yes. Yeah, and uh, we took a year off and uh, I was uh, uh, a senior fellow there and uh, stayed in New York City for a year. And Then I brought my wife there and she stayed as a, as a postdoc later on. So we worked in New York City. This was during the time of the crack cocaine epidemic and so we were doing some studies. That's about 1991? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 91. Uh, under Giuliani, I think. Yeah. No, it was under, uh, who was the African-American mayor at the time. Uh, but he's the only one that's been the mayor there, so yeah. that's been African-American. But then John Jay was there, and I got a chance to do some stuff at John Jay. Took some courses at... Um, uh, City College of New York on, on drug drug control and all mm -hmm. that kind of good stuff. And just enjoyed a year there. While I was there, the person I appointed as the acting chair uh, decided that he, he wanted the job. And so he constantly talked to the president about my misdeeds. Uh, and so when I got back, uh, the president says, you can only stay uh, in your office until five o'clock each day. So once I stayed until six or seven, they sent the police to remo forcibly remove me from my office. Why was that? Uh, because I, the, the whole university was somewhat uh, jealous of the amount of money I was bringing in. And the president wanted to use the grant and I always fought him mm. for putting people on the grant. And so uh, he said, uh, you no longer can be chair, which, you know, at, at a black college, presidents run the university. They're like God. And uh, so I then said, I better leave this place. This is no longer good for me. Okay. And uh, so I left. And you moved to Seattle. Yeah. Uh, Bob Crutchfield had a lot to do with that. He came down to recruit uh, students from the graduate school for the PhD program. And I had known Bob from sociology because I was also a member of Triple SB and which uh, is uh, Society for the Study of Social Problems, okay. and uh, also uh, sociology. And then they had a minority group, which broke from sociology and started their own meetings. Um, and I had known Bob from sociology meetings, and so we started to talk. And he said, "Why don't you come to Washington? We're looking for an, an associate dean." And he said, we pay well. And I was making about maybe 30000 then as dean, as chair. And uh, so I went up to Washington. And the dean of the graduate school says, why don't you go and look for a house the same day? So I took off and started looking for a house. Uh, so, so did you get a big salary jump when you moved? Twi over twice as much. There you go. Yeah. <clears throat> and then you've been in... At the University of Washington until yeah, you retired. So, yeah, until I retired. And you still live in Seattle? I still live in Seattle. You, Lovely place. Still go to the UW football game? Yeah, we are ranked as of last week. We're yeah. ranked fourth. Yeah, well, and then they got beat. Yes. Okay, and now you're not. <laughs> no, we're six to six. <laughs> uh, but that was, that was uh, fun. But there were a lot of things that happened okay. uh, in between there. I interviewed for Dean's job at the uh, University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. And... Uh, uh, had actually thought I was going to move there, and uh, the social work department voted it down by one vote. I think so. Uh, they said, "Well, we want a person with a MSW, and you don't have an MSW." And so uh, I think the, the CREM department said, "Well, you asked for a person to have both departments, and now you're saying you want an MSW." So that was a bit of pill to swallow because I thought I was moving to Milwaukee. I did not know how fortunate I was not to move to Milwaukee. But there were some good friends uh, at Milwaukee, uh, John Connolly, 
uh, and Carl Pope. And Carl was getting a lot of judo grants, and Carl would invite me up. And uh, Carl and John and myself would go to Western meetings, and we ensured that we got on the first panel of the first day at 8 o'clock in the morning. No one ever showed up except for the panel. And then we'd take off for the whole weekend. Uh, we did that for many, many years. Uh, but um, that was uh, the beginning of my uh, association with those great guys at, at Milwaukee. Milwaukee. What, really when, good as a matter of fact, when you were still in Atlanta, didn't you invite John, or, um, John came Carl, down. Carl Pope down yeah, for Carl, this Yeah, Carl came down and spent a year with us. Uh, this is a disproportionate right. representation of my yes, he, he 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 was just a great guy. I guess he was a Catholic. Wasn't he a prefect at times? He had been, yes. Yeah, he had been a prefect. And he was an ultra-liberal. And so he worked with all our, our graduate students. And they learned a lot from him. And then right after that, Cora May Mann came the next year and spent a year with us working with uh, black females in the criminal justice system and got some articles off of that. So we out all the time. Uh, Connolly invited me up to Buffalo. Uh, it's a great place to be in the summertime. Uh, so I spent a summer working at Buffalo, uh, and then it was just uh, in the 70s when they had the riot at uh, Attica. So I got a chance to go up to Attica and talk to some of the inmates and stayed in touch with them for about 10 years. Uh, but uh, that was an interesting time in Buffalo. Uh, but Connolly uh, has been just a great friend uh, in terms of of helping me and moving through the system. But there was not a mentor at all for me when I came in, I think. Uh, when I joined the organizations, um, I was the only one. Uh, and it, uh, it, it, it's a mixed feeling being the only one in a large organization like ASC. Um, and then later on, uh, Corme came. And, uh, so that was even better because Cora May was, was very feisty. And uh, we would go to the meetings and go to, and argue with everybody there. You know, one of our, our big arguments was that white people were doing, was doing all the research on black people. And they hadn't lived in communities. They had no idea of what was going on. And so that's how we got into uh, looking at uh, uh, the black community and studying the black community. And uh, so that was, was, was really quite nice to have Coromay here. And then gradually some more people came in. Coromay was basically responsible for turning out a lot of black academics from Florida State. Uh, and so she really was responsible for more than what I was responsible for at uh, ASC. So I miss her a lot. Yeah. So, okay, so let, let's build off of that. So in terms of your own research agenda, as you're going, and we're talking about your academic appointments and your leadership in various administrative roles, um, we want to talk a little bit about your, I mean, if, as, as I look at your, uh, your CV, I see that, you know, a variety of research, but the one common thread, of course, was you dealt with African Americans, mm -hmm. with the one exception of a very large <clears throat> one and a half million dollar study on Cuban residential program in Atlanta. Could you say, that was kind of an interesting thing. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, this was during the Carter administration. The Carter had, had told uh, Castro that uh, release your people, they have a home in the U.S. And Castro released all of his people in the mental hospitals and all the people who had been in prisons. So for those people who said they had been uh, locked up before, he then locked them up in federal prisons uh, throughout the U.S. And Atlanta took a large portion of those people. The curious thing about you mean that, the federal prison in yeah, Atlanta? Yeah, the federal, federal okay. prison in Atlanta. Okay. Uh, the curious thing about that is that Ed Meese at the time was the attorney general. And these prisoners were just like the prisoners that are over in, in Cuba now at, at Gitmore because they had an indefinite sentence. Uh, there was no way it could get out. And so NIH decided that they, what they wanted to do was to interview the prisoners at Atlanta and provide a sanction for them and to live in, in the city uh, of Atlanta. 
So they provided funds for me to hire a full-time psychiatrist, full-time psychologist, and uh, some social workers. And we ran the program uh, in Atlanta for these uh, about 50 inmates over time. And the interesting thing is that we completely failed. And we did not rehabilitate anyone. We had a murder in the place. We had uh, uh, arsonists who set the place on fire. Uh, we had knifings there, and it was an exciting time. Every day I went to work, there was something different. Uh, but the money kept coming in, and we kept taking it. And uh, we tried to, to really make a difference uh, with the Cubans. I learned a little Spanish, uh, but not enough to keep up with all the guys that were in the house. And so uh, that continues today. There are a lot of Cubans still in the federal prison system. Uh, with indefinite sentences. They, they will never get out. And uh, I think that has to be changed with, with our judiciary system in terms of locking people up for indefinite periods of time without allowing them uh, constitutional rights. That's very interesting. Because um, I, I don't think many people know about that mm -hmm. at all. Um, the other thing I noticed in, in looking over your, your, your CV is that you also did, I mean, Atlanta is, is a historically black university. <clears throat> and as you said, you, <clears throat> excuse me, as you said, you'd never been on campus before. Yeah. But one of your projects while you were at Atlanta, right after you came back from the drug council in New York, yeah. you did a project on uh, doing drug research at historically black universities. Tell yeah. me why you why and what you did? Well, I had been doing some work with, uh, with NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse. And one of the things that we had found out is that white, whites use drugs much more than blacks. And of course, they were arresting blacks at a higher rate. And, but they use drugs uh, for a lesser period of time. Blacks start later in life and use drugs longer. But on, on campuses, uh, whites drink and party and use a lot of drugs. Whereas at HBCUs, they don't drink, they don't party, because uh, it's the culture. I mean, it, uh, they don't allow, the presidents don't allow that to go on in the early 70s. It may go on today, but it didn't go on then. Uh, when they had the march in Jackson, Mississippi, and they killed, they shot up Jackson State College, I went down there and the president said, all you students go home, and every student left the university. Whereas at Berkeley, if you said all you students go home, they would take over the university and stay. And so the culture of black communities is so different than the culture of white communities, uh, in the sense that you don't talk back to your parents, you have no, no opinions, and if you sit down with older people, you don't talk. Uh, you go to church, on Sundays when you're young until uh, you, you, have, you have to be at church. I went to church every Sunday all day. Uh, my, mo uh, my mother would not allow my father to have a drink in the house, could not have any alcohol in the house, could not play cards, could not uh, uh, go to movies on Sundays. And uh, we grew up that way and it was always yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no ma'am. You had no opinion. Whereas in white communities, they start allowing their kids uh, a lot of freedom at a very young age. And it just doesn't go on, go on well in my day when I was growing up as a child in communities. So I think that's why I, I, I wanted to do that study. And we did find that black kids did not use drugs. Even though they started at later uh, ages in their lifetime, they were not using drugs at, at, in black school, uh, black universities. Okay. Very interesting. So as I look over the CV, I mean, basically, in addition to these two major, ma I say major because I find them interesting, pieces that we just talked about, but most of your work, obviously, the body of it, or the corpus would be called race and crime. Mm -hmm. And some of it's communities and ecology, some of it is, is the disproportionate overrepresentation of minorities in the criminal justice system. Uh, some of it is drugs and, and race, and tie that then to crime. Uh, and so the race and crime really is the theme of your life in yes. terms of your work. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the body. 
And um, I also noted that, that uh, well, and, and of course you have a couple of books by that title yeah. that you wrote over, over some, some period of time. In fact, the first one came out in 1981, and then 2002 was the, was the, the second of your race, crime, and criminal justice books. So I think it's about time for a third. I would think so. It's been another 20 years. Yeah. Uh, so been 20 years. Almost so. Mm -hmm. But um, what you did in 2002, in addition to the race and crime and criminal justice book, was you, you there was a, a, an anthology put together, very similar to what we're doing here today, by Gil Geis huh. and, I'm trying to remember. Uh, what her name is. A, a co-author. I'm sorry, I've forgotten. Dodge. Dodge, Mary Dodge. Thank you. Mary, yeah. And in that, uh, you wrote, you were one of the authors, and you wrote a, a chapter entitled Reflections of an African-American Criminologist. Mm -hmm. Now, that was in 2002, so now you have more time to reflect, and that's part of what we're doing today, but what would be kind of the, what, what, what reflections, reflections did you share then that you might think are no longer relevant or even more relevant today? I think the, the increase, which has been very small, uh, black criminologists coming in, like uh, uh, Miss, uh, and even at the end, uh, Fisherman, I can, I'm trying to think about her first name. Um, but a lot of people come into ASC that are now African Americans and Africans as well. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to mentor them in such a way that they understand that life has not changed that much. Uh, we do have mentoring programs going on, but there's still a, a, a there's still a, a, a missing link in, in what happens to black uh, academics. And that missing link is that uh, the socialization of academics does not include the black community uh, at any of the universities very much. I, I can count on one hand uh, at the University of Washington when I've been invited to, to white professors' homes uh, and be part of that whole group of, of socialization, which is extremely important uh, as you progress in the field. If you're going to move up in the field, uh, you need that interaction, you need to know people, and that just doesn't happen. Uh, I, I reflect upon uh, the DPPC now in terms of looking at that, it's become nearly an all-black organization. You need to tell us what those initials are. Oh. Jesus. Division of, of black, black, no, Division of People of Color. And crime. Crime, yeah. yes. yes. Uh, for the for and, American Society of Criminal Yeah, and that's, that started uh, in 1993 yeah. with uh, Ruth Peterson and myself getting, trying to start a division. Uh, a lot of opposition. Uh, we were not able to really get as much support as we wanted. We got a lot of support from um, white criminologists. And Frida Adler at the time was the uh, president and she was very supportive. And of course, uh, Charles Welford came right afterwards. Um, but it was an effort to get people to sign the petition. We had to get, I think, one third of the membership to sign. Uh, and so we finally got it signed. We got it, the division started. And since that time, there are now 11 uh, divisions, which are, I think are too many divisions, but you're not going to get rid of them. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it was difficult. We had a lot of white members initially when we started. There are a lot of whites doing research on blacks and crime, uh, but there aren't a lot of whites showing up uh, at, at, at our meetings or at the luncheons. Uh, in addition to that, we started the Minority Dance Program, which was very, very uh, popular <coughs> about 20 years ago. It was a fundraiser? Yeah, it was, it was a fundraiser during for scholarships. The conference? Yeah, for scholarships. And we started that, and we had people like David Hawkins and myself uh, hawking tickets before the dance started. We would see who could sell the most you tickets. You were only people at the yeah, conference. Right, at, at the conference is getting them to buy, buy, buy a ticket. ticket. Whether you're going to go or not, buy yeah, a ticket. Exactly. Right. And so last night I asked, and the tickets were sold out for the luncheon. And you can't get a, a ticket practically to go. I can sell you mine for about $50 instead of just 25 if you want to buy it. Well, last year you charged me 100 so I know, yeah. It's a bargain this it year. It is a bargain this year and stuff. But uh, those okay. are the kinds of, 
of things that I think would 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 induce people going into the field. People are just not going into the field. Uh, at the uh, University of Washington, I don't think we have one uh, person who's in sociology that's of African descent. And uh, so it, it's not a lot of people going in the field. You mentioned that it was you and Ruth Peterson who started that division, yeah. and I think it's interesting to note for that this year the president of the American Society of Criminology is Ruth Peterson. So. Um, yeah, that was, it was interesting because I don't think Ruth and I were just uh, great uh, administrators of that division, although we were the first, first presidents, co-presidents of the division. I don't think that we did a, as good a job as we could have. Uh, but it was interesting, started, we had a table, we had problems of setting up the table, we had a problem of trying to schedule uh, our presentations uh, on doing the middle of the week rather than on Saturday morning uh, at, at uh, the last day of the yeah. session. We had problems of trying to not schedule our things after luncheon. So I was on the council for four years and tried to get some of that squared away. And so now uh, it's, it's much better in terms of scheduling. Uh, but there still are a lot of problems. I mean, people are, are still very uptight about uh, African Americans, and uh, but it's it's um, it's a feeling that you you get when you're in the field that uh, there are difficulties still going on. I, I mentioned uh, Lee Brown, who has more credits to his his uh, vita than any person I know. He was uh, Houston uh, chief of police for two terms. Then he was mayor. He was uh, Commissioner in New York City, uh, police. Police commission, yeah. Right, police commission. He was appointed by the president to uh, run the, uh, uh, what is it, the, uh, what is it, the drug, um, he was a drug czar. The drug czar? Yeah, he was a drug czar. Yeah. And uh, what else? And then he was in Atlanta as uh, um, chief of public safety. And uh, there have been a lot of monitor monitors of police in this country. Uh, I tried to get uh, Seattle to uh, interview him, and they didn't even send him an application. Uh, and so he has not been able to be a, a, a monitor as a police chief. Uh, but so their value is not is not as as high as it should be. Uh, the police started an organization called the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, uh, and during the '60s. Uh, every major city had a black police chief because the riots were there and so the community wanted to do something to put out the riots. They thought that the police chiefs could do it and uh, they didn't know that uh, black police officers generally were much rougher on blacks in communities than whites because they wouldn't impress uh, the white police officers that they could be severe and stuff. Uh, so. Uh, uh, it, it, there's a long ways to go when you begin to look at police chiefs and you begin to look at secretaries of, of corrections and uh, they, are, they are the people who are in the institutions but they're not the people who really run the institutions. Okay, that gives me a good segue because I think in addition to your, you know, all the research you've done, academic leadership you've done, you also were very heavily involved in, in important community commissions and roles uh, something like you just mentioned, the police. Uh, one of the back in the 80s, you were part of the International Association of Chiefs of Police Commission on the use of deadly force, which today is a very current topic. Uh, and so, and then just quickly going through, uh, I'll, I'll read off a few of these. Maybe you might want to respond to one or more. Uh, in the late 80s, you are uh, on Atlanta's Mayor's uh, Police Civilian Review Board and the Metropolitan Atlanta's Crime Commission. Uh, you were on the Fulton County Drug Task Force. In fact, you chaired the task force for Fulton County, which is the county in which Atlanta is located. Uh, you chaired Washington State's Correctional Training Board uh, for five years, six years. Um, so you've, you've been actively involved in the community using your professional knowledge and skills to try to translate into policy. Uh, of those that I read, there may be more that I'm not aware of, but I mean, how do you feel about that? Well, I feel they, very strongly about it. Giving your time yeah. and, 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 and yeah, you knew they were all free. 
course. Of course, yeah. Yeah, you don't get paid for this. No, none right. of this. Yeah. Uh, so I said giving, giving your time, yeah. not selling your time. Yeah. So, it, it I mean, did you feel like it was worthwhile? To, I mean, you feel you made made a difference, or at least it was worth the effort to make yeah. the difference? I think we made a difference in terms of looking at uh, the crime commissions in, in Atlanta, Metropolitan Crime Commission, because that was comprised of all the police forces and all the correctional forces, mm -hmm. and and uh, we had meetings uh, uh, every once a month, and we invited people in for speakers and stuff. And it was comprised of the uh, the Coca-Cola Foundation uh, and the people who ran Atlanta. Atlanta didn't have a riot because of Martin Luther King and also because of, of uh, Coca-Cola and uh, and uh, uh, who else was the other? Uh, oh, Delta. Delta. Atlanta. Yeah, and so those were the two big uh, corporations in, in in Atlanta, and they really ran the city. And but they ran it without people knowing who ran the city. Uh, and they were able to keep uh, the uh, riots down and also to keep uh, black people in a place. And what I say to that is that uh, they knew the movers and shakers in the black community. Uh, they would allow uh, black people in Atlanta to run the government but not control the money. And so even today, uh, we have a black mayor and we have black council people in Atlanta but they don't control the, the monies that would come in and out of Atlanta. That's controlled by whites. Um, and so we were able to interact with those people in communities to try to make a difference. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that uh, black people are still not where they should be uh, in today's world. And they're still being locked up at a higher rate than anybody else. They still are being shot at and killed at a higher rate than anybody else. Uh, and when you began to, to ask questions about that, they said, well, black people commit the kinds of crimes that uh, are violent crimes and that the police respond to that. But that's not really an answer uh, to the issue of why are blacks uh, treated differently than whites in, in the criminal justice system. Uh, so I think we made a small dent in what's going on, but I think we're making a bigger dent now with the new academics that's, that's coming into into the field. Uh, these young people are very smart, very bright, and very articulate. And so they're on a national uh, um, scale now that things are changing, but very gradually. And they still feel that uh, they could do better. I mean, when you begin to look at the national elections and you begin to look at things, and you say, did the president make a difference? And you say, marginally, he probably did. But when he moved into, into the job, uh, we had people saying that, you know, you will only be here for one term. And people still saw him as black. They didn't see him as the president, per se. So I think there, there's a long ways to go in, in the system. Uh, so uh, all of these organizations I joined because of two things. One is that I thought I could make a difference. And I think I did. And I joined also because I'm a social being. I love to be around people. Uh, I can't uh, study at home. I have to go to the library because there are people moving all the time at the library. I have to, I have to be at a library. Uh, so I would always get a, 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 a place to study in the library at, at the University of Washington at Atlanta and get things done. But if I stay home, I find all kinds of things to do rather than get work done. Uh, I'm more of a, I'm less of an academic, but more of a, of a, of a community activist. Uh, I, I, I say what, what I would have liked to have done is to be able to write like you have and be as scholarly as you are and uh, make a bigger difference than you do. Well, you've made a big difference. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of that, uh, among the various recognitions and awards that you received, uh, you received an award for service um, from the well, my notes here, the, um, the the division of people of color and crime in 2002 uh, awarded you the distinguished service award. Uh, you received two awards for your mentoring, uh, one from the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences years ago, and then one more recently from the University of Washington. Um, so obviously, you know you have you talked earlier about. Uh, 
uh, students of color, African American students, and trying to get them mentored, get them involved. And that's been kind of another theme throughout your, your entire academic career, starting in Maryland, right. and, then, and obviously in Atlanta U, and, and then at Washington. So how, how do you mentor? I mean, what, what, I guess here, what's the secret? What's well, a good mentor? What I think a good mentor is one who checks in on his mentee more than once a year. <coughs> uh, a good, good mentor is one who also asks questions of, of uh, the scholars around the mentee uh, to find out how that person is coming. When you first go into a university, people are nice to you, but they don't tell you what's needed to get tenure. Uh, and that's, as I told you, happened at Maryland for me. And so I try immediately to tell them how to bargain for salary, how to bargain for uh, space, how to bargain for equipment. All the scarce resources. All the scarce resources. And that you do that before you sign on a dotted yeah. line. And also how to find out if faculties are cohesive. The most important thing about mentoring is that you go to a university and you have two sides and they're always fighting. So one will recommend you for tenure, the other one will not, only because of, um, of they don't like the people on the other side. So I try to get them to talk to people who have been around that university for long periods of time. And uh, I, I mentor young scholars coming in I also mentor young PhD students to tell them how to spend their time because uh, as a minority you can spend all your time helping minority students. Students want to have somebody their color to talk to. So you can go to the university on, on a Monday or Tuesday and you spend six hours talking to students. And it's fun, you like to do it, uh, but that's not what you should be doing. I tell them that they should stay home. Uh, certain days of the week and don't schedule classes every single day and that you can negotiate that when you start. Uh, I tell them to, to stay home and and work on get on, your own you work know, done. To get your work done. Yeah. And that's the only way to get your work done. And I also tell them to negotiate that when they're signing up. Get at least six months off from work before you start teaching and at with pet full pay. Right. And uh, so I work with that. But with undergraduate students uh, it's important to tell them how important the first year is and where to sit in classrooms. Don't sit in the back of the classroom uh, and where you can play with your, your tech, technology. Uh, go to class every single day. Uh, take notes uh, at the beginning of the class. Read the material before you go to class. Take notes after you come out of class. As soon as you have free time, uh, go over your notes and make sure that you know them. So you looked at the notes two or three times and when you come to study for an exam at three o'clock in the morning, uh, you look at your information and you know it all. But when I was coming through at three o'clock in the morning, I looked at the information and I didn't know it all. Even though I had taken notes, I skipped some stuff. So I think that's important as well. And then I also tell them that criminology is fun. Criminology is, is a discipline that you don't go to sleep on. We have a class that was taught by Joe Weiss, who was also a decrim from Berkeley, and it was called Murder. And he would get 700 students per quarter into that class. He had to cut it off at that. He had seven uh, TAs, teaching assistants, and he had a, a supervising teaching assistant. But the class was fun. And so he taught that for many years before he retired from uh, the University of Washington. So I try to mentor undergraduates. I try to convince people that they should come to uh, two places. One is historical black colleges, because once you meet uh, teachers and professors at these HBCUs and students, these are your friends that you will be around for life. These are the people that you stay with. When you ask me how many friends do I have at the University of San Francisco, since I graduated in 1953, I would say one. And he's white, not, not black, because I was the only um, uh, black student in my class when I graduated from USF. I never had a black teacher at uh, graduate or undergraduate uh, universities. But it's important that you do that as well. It's also important that you, you stay in touch uh, with people at your university. If you decide to go to a 
an all-white university. Uh, there are really interesting people that you meet, and uh, John is one, and Connolly is the other, and Carl Pope is the other. These are the three people, uh, my lifetime friends. These are people that we get together for baseball, and these are people that I love. Uh, so it, it's not just all a black and a white thing, but it's important that you, you meet friends that are there for life, and these people are, are in my life for, for, forever. So uh, I, I say that uh, going to college is historical, going to college is fun. My parents never went to college, they graduated from high school. Um, and my brother uh, was a biochemist, got a master's in biochemistry from Berkeley. My sister became a nurse and I don't know how that happened, I still don't know how it happened because we were never encouraged per se to go to school, we just went. Uh, so it's important that we do these kinds of things and try to uh, make a difference in the world. As I grow older, um, I think about what kinds of contributions have I made to this world. And uh, I'm not happy with the, I think I could have made more contributions than I did. I think I could have also smoked cigars and drank a little more. <laughs> well, you, yeah, you could have been drinking more because you don't drink at all. Yeah. So that would have been an easy yeah, goal. Yeah. <laughs> just one break and you've got yeah. that one done. Um, well, one more thing I just want to, before we wrap this up, I think we're running short on time, but um, you, you, you mentioned that you were one of the founders of the, the Division of People of Color and Crime for the American Society of Criminology. Uh, and then, of course, it's grown over time, and it's, it's now it's a huge success, at least in terms of membership. Right, yeah. I'm not sure yeah, how else you might define yeah. success. It may not be successful in all dimensions. But one of the things I want to lead to here is that they have recently created an award in your honor, in your name. It's called the Julius Debrow Award, and it's given every year. And it's, according to the award, it says it's in recognition of outstanding contributions in service to professional organizations, which clearly you were there, to academic institutions, which clearly represents you, and to the advancement of criminal justice, which you've done, you spent your career, your life doing. How does that, I mean, that, that gives you a piece of immortality. It's, it's an award in your name, and 40 years from now, there'll still be somebody up there getting that Julius Devereaux Award. How do you respond, how do you feel with that? How do you respond to that? I'm kind of embarrassed. Are you humble? <laughs> and I'm, no, you're not humble. <laughs> I've got to really, what happened is that I, I think it came about because in 2002, uh, I became very ill. And uh, I nearly died at the. I was in the hospital for three months, and so I think that people decided that hey, this guy's going to die pretty soon, so we need to make an award for him. But seriously, it it, it is uh, humbling, and it makes me feel very proud to to have that award. And uh, I look forward to coming to to ASC to see the people who've gotten that award over time. Uh, but uh, it's it's. I don't know whether I deserve it or not, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got it. Yeah. Uh, because this organization means a lot to me. I think this is where you grow in this organization, as well as the Western Society of Criminology, as well as the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences. And I belong to all three of them. Uh, I have, they, they have not made money on me because I bought lifetime awards a long time ago. And I think these lifetime awards were like 300 bucks. And so I've had them for 20 years a piece, I think, of more, and I'll live until I'm 100. So I make a lot of money off this association. But um, you meet a lot of people in the field. You meet a lot of people who have done really great things in this field. Uh, I am still disappointed with ASC because they don't take many policy issues. The only issue that I know ASC has taken has been on the death penalty, and that was in. Uh, when Chambliss was uh, president, Bill, Chambliss. Was in, Bill, yeah, Chambliss. Bill Chambliss, yeah, and that was in Montreal, yeah. and a lot of people don't know about that, uh, that that they did take a, a stand on the death penalty, uh, and I think they should take more, more stands on issues rather than just avoiding them. Well, especially the the, yeah. the obvious over overrepresentation of minorities right. in mm -hmm. the criminal justice system, which we always recognize. Right. Everybody, it's not news to anybody that there is this overrepresentation, mm -hmm. and yet. As you say, there's never a public statement from the society right. about the, that and a lot of other similar issues 
about which there's a strong consensus uh, within the within the discipline. Right, and I also look at economics of, of crime that were involved black people. And the black people used to play the numbers. Mm -hmm. And when I was in Buffalo, I had students who would leave class uh, to go out and help their parents play the distribute the numbers. And so this the, is before the lottery was legal, right? And and so they decided to make the lottery legal, and uh, who benefited from that? Uh, they also decided to uh, make alcohol legal. Who benefited from that? And now they're into making marijuana legal. I never thought that I would get a PhD. I never thought that uh, I would get out of Mississippi. And so life in these 85 years it has been, uh, has been good to me. And the societies have been good to me as well. And uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy. Well, it started off well because when you went to the University of San Francisco, you were there with Bill Russell yeah. and Casey Jones. Casey Jones and yeah. so good pedigree. I right. mean, if they didn't have many African Americans there, but they were very right. selective and they brought in the athletes. Right, they did. They yeah. brought in a lot of athletes. And I didn't know that the only people who lived on campus uh, were athletes until about five years ago. Yeah. We lived on campus. I had no idea. I just didn't have any knowledge of of the academic world, and I still don't have a lot of knowledge of, of the academic world, how it works, what you do, and I encouraged in my mentoring students not only to, to teach and to learn, but also to get into administration uh, for a short period of time. Yeah. Don't stay too long. <laughs> <laughs> Words of wisdom to live by. <laughs> we can all agree. Yeah. All right, thank you, Julius. Yeah. Appreciate it.